Good evening. I'd like to say hello to everybody. Some of you, of course, it's actually good afternoon and for others it may be good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. But we're now going to come to the second part of what we're doing today, which is to have a discussion among a number of panelists for about 40 minutes or so. So the people we have here are obviously Tom McLeish, and we're going to be joined in a second by Rowan Williams and by Fraser Watts, who is already here. And we have two people who are joining us specially now for this discussion. We have Sarah Coakley, who is visiting professorial fellow at the Australian Catholic University and honorary professor at the University of Andrews, and Sarah Lane Ritchie, who is lecturer in theology and science at the University of Edinburgh. Sarah Coakley, perhaps if I can start with you, it's a rather large question, but is there any one thing in particular that Tom said in his lecture that sparks something in you that you'd either like to comment on or ask a question about? Well, thank you so much uh, for the honor of being part of this conversation. I'm going to be a bit naughty and put a triadic question on the table, but Tom doesn't have to answer all of it all at once. And I move from the severely practical to the theologically speculative, but they are related. The first, I think all of us will be wanting to know what Tom would like to see happen to our school and university curricula in order to respond to the challenges he so richly put before us uh, this evening. And uh, as it were, after the fact, to C.P. Snow's famous uh, worries about the two cultures, originally set forth in 1959. Um, I'm particularly interested in here in um, whether it always ought to be the case that the sciences are taught from the start alongside the history of science. Mm -hmm. Because I think almost everything that um, Tom has said this evening has showed us that if we only understood better how these great scientists of the past came to the visions and conclusions they came to, we would have a much richer sense already of how imagination and poetry cannot be left out of the picture. The second point moves on from this. It's a bit more challenging to Tom, I suppose, um, philosophically, because I noticed that he skirted around altogether something that Rowan touched on when he talked at Rowan about the covert metaphysics of so much of contemporary science. Um, and I wonder therefore whether Tom could say something about the importance of philosophy and philosophy of science in particular as equally important as accompaniments to even our rudimentary teaching of science um, to young people in schools. It's in this area, after all, that what Tom called the tawdry conflict notion between science and theology most often resides. Because if uh, physics is smuggling in a certain kind of reductive naturalism, for instance, without declaring it a philosophical option, um, as opposed to intrinsic to the science itself, then we're right off onto such a um, conflict model from the outset. There are, of course, different problems in different areas of science here. But again, I would want to ask Tom whether we really need philosophy of, philosophy of science alongside science, just as much as history of science. The third question goes more into the territory of the theological and I'm sure many people are puzzling tonight about Tom's fourth point, about its uh, originality, its ingenuity. The idea that he wants to invert an old natural theological approach where you look at the book of nature and then argue for God, and instead look at the book of nature through the eyes of God, through the notion of a contemplative gaze. But I couldn't help wondering as a theologian whether Tom didn't sneak up on this point by a kind of sleight of hand from his first three points, because it would be perfectly possible to agree that we need poetry and imagination in science and still declare God an unnecessary hypothesis. So I'm wondering where Tom wants to go with this theologically um, in greater length than he was able to give us in the course of the lecture, <laughs> and whether this is indeed, in some ways, a kind of inverse natural theology that he is suggesting. Thank you. Now, Tom, you're welcome to respond to that, but I'm worried about the phrase greater length, so over to you. 
I'm also concerned that people think that this is somehow everyone asking me questions. At this point in the evening, I've basically said everything I'm ever going to say for the next 30 years. <laughs> so I suggest that other wiser people like Sarah and Ron, yourself, Michael, also <laughs> weigh, weigh in. Uh, please do. <laughs> um, but uh, and also note, everyone, the delicious and delightful way that, that, that academics uh, politely um, uh, wrap their iron fists in the velvet gloves of don't you think <laughs> actually accused of skirting round of, <laughs> of omission of sleight of hand in the most delightful <laughs> way that's why I'm so delighted that Sarah could be here and the other Sarah you could wait or some of you heard us talk on Sunday morning okay so super briefly yes I mean as you know not only hope but have tried to do this until uh, very recently I stepped into Michael's much former shoes actually at the Royal Society as chair of the education committee. Um, I've made many trips to the Department of Education, many conversations with ministers of education. Of course, Brexit for the last four years has dominated everything and really stumped progress in almost any other, uh, other areas, but absolutely are fragmented and super concentrated, particularly differentiated uh, education system, particularly post 16 in England and Wales. Um, is not fit for purpose, but it's not fit for purpose anywhere really. And a broader, more balanced and deeply connected curriculum. You know, the world doesn't have disciplines and departments. Um, mm. and, and so we need to think in rather fresh ways. And I do not believe we're equipping our young people for mm. a flexible and imaginative future um, by, by snipping up the disciplines, particularly across the two cultures that you mentioned. So absolutely, yes. Um, what we need to do, one little, there's all sorts of lovely green growth signs here, the Institute for Research and Science, some of the Royal Society's partnership schemes, but we can get there, I think, not in one big leap, but in little leaps, that in, uh, what we, one thing we need, that in, in, in every stage, not just when you're doing your A-level project, or whatever that ends to be, and let's go beyond A-levels, um, but every stage science needs to involve play and a little bit of experiment, a little bit of what if. Now, which is not to say Dear Minister, with whom I've been since a thousand times, but I'm trying to claim that that knowledge, you know, um, that, that we don't value knowledge or learning knowledge. I was able to say once, you know, Minister, you know, I do represent the Royal Society. It, you, you may have no fear that, that in any way our organisation would advocate an undervaluing of scientific knowledge, but process too. Um, actually, Rowan will have something to say. He's already mentioned uh, Simone Weil and her school studies of receptivity. Um, and I'll mention one wonderful moment of contemplative awe. I was with hundreds of research students at the University of Sheffield once celebrating their uh, molecular biology um, center. And, and the, essentially a tired platform of Nobel Prize winners. Absolutely wonderful. And one great scientist who's a, a morphologist, a development officer, halfway through his talk stopped put his speech to one side, took his glasses off, gazed into these young faces, put them back on so he could see them and said, colleagues, young colleagues particularly, please, please, I'm so worried about these computers and automated experiment. Just can I implore you to look down your microscopes? Just gaze, don't expect to see anything, just start observing and attention, attention. So there we go. Um, so yes, yes, yes. Philosophy, totally yes. My best experience, again, hopeful experience, visiting um, uh, a school in Camborne, Camborne Academy <laughs> once, who wrote to me, uh, said to the Royal Society, please come see what we're doing. Um, uh, introduced me to their, their eight and nine-year-olds philo philosoph philosophy class. You know, I do some medieval science. They are the only audience I've ever given my gross test talk, talk, all of whom knew Aristotle's four causes. And I could take it on from there. And I've given that talk in Cambridge, Harvard, Oxford. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I do think there's, without being trivial, I think there's, there is real hope here. As for your final question, um, let me not launch another lecture. I didn't know. I got it, I got it from j reading Job which I've always felt as a young son, when I first read that book, I felt this, this was speaking to me as a scientist with a scient and a Christian with a scientific vocation in entirely new ways. I read the secondary literature, it didn't help me at all. I had to read through that book myself and start looking through Job's eyes with 10 or 20 years experience as a, as a scientist. Then I began to realize, as it was Celia who said, you realize that this is Dean Drummond, 180 degrees away from natural philosophy. But of course, let me say one more thing. If you're looking not at God, but with him in his image, you are much closer to him, her, to God's self, than you are in the old way. You are, in fact, shoulder to shoulder 
dare we whisper it? There is a theological closeness to this view, but at that point, I, I, I must, must stop the directions. Um, thank you very much indeed. Can I say for those of you putting questions into the question and answer facility, I am reading them all, and we will get on to some of them, but I won't be able to do justice to all of them. But I wondered, first of all, Sarah Lane Ritchie, if there's anything that's been said so far that sparked your thoughts. Yes, absolutely. Many things. Um, just a couple in particular that I'd raise. Um, Tom, in his lecture this evening, gave us, I think, a really exemplary example of that for which he argues, right? He's blending form and content here in a way that is actually very beautiful and demonstrates a sort of imaginative posture that he's arguing for. Um, he speaks of the elasticity of air in polymer chains, but does so with an expansive spirit and an openness, I think that can only ever enhance <clears throat> the clarity and incisiveness of what we would call the hard science. And so I think that is half the value here in this talk, because I just want, I want to flag that up. Um, but Tom, in your lecture, you raised two possibilities that I find particularly tantalizing. Uh, first is this insistence that imagination is a legitimate pathway to knowledge mm -hmm. uh, in, partner with, in partnership with reason, of course. Uh, and then second, an invitation to see science as a shared cultural experience rather than in a domain restricted to those with PhDs in chemistry or physics. Uh, so everything in me responds with an unequivocal yes to both of these possibilities. Um, but lest I get carried away with myself, which I admit that I am frequently prone to do, I want to force myself to stop for a moment and ask the questions that I am sure people are asking here. Um, namely, how? How? And so in particular, um, about moving science from a professional endeavor to a shared cultural experience. Um, it's hard to imagine that a Nobel Prize in physics is going to be going into a layman anytime soon. And indeed, uh, I think that we could probably push back on this cultural invitation uh, by pointing to lay science gone wrong. Uh, thinking, for example, of anti-vaxxers who insist on using these morsels of science, these morsels of pseudoscience, and then a heavy dose of conspiracy thinking and blending it all together and convincing themselves and others that they are engaging in layman's scientific inquiry. They think they are doing science. Mm. Uh, and then they push back on elite scientists as people not to be trusted because they're in this elite ivory tower. So even as I reject this sort of logic, I do recognize that many that are caught up in this way of thinking think they're doing a good thing. And they also fear the caricatured version of science that threatens to disenchant the world and to strip it of all its magic and deep mystery, which I think is also your aim too, to push back against that caricature. So my question here is how? How do we distance ourselves from where this goes wrong? Um, mm. I have many other questions, but I think I'll leave that there. Um, yes, but how is always the question, isn't, isn't it? Um, I mean, actually, Michael, who, who has a, a, a career in thinking about science education, uh, and Rona, I can imagine, will have uh, more wise things to say about this than, than I will. But I think what I'd say is that my, my hunch, it, it's, you know, my, I, my, to say my belief, my tentative hypothesis is, look, um, the, this warped, um, way of doing science, the, the pseudoscience of, of the anti-vaxxers, the climate change denials and so on. Well, you know, from, of course, from one point of view, it's okay. It, it's, you know, they, they have put one toe in, 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 in the door. Um, but, <laughs> but you see, I think, that, I think the failure there is a consequence of, of the broken ladder. Um, you, you know, you see, no, uh, no lay citizen science is likely to win a Nobel Prize, you know, and, you know, my amateur horn playing is never going to get me um, a, a, a front first desk at the, <laughs> in the LSO anytime soon or ever. But, but because I have to struggle with embouchure and toning, um, I understand um, what some of the difficulties and the processes are. Um, you know, way, way ab above me. And I have, a, my hunch is that, well, look, you know, the current model is broken. You know, I mean, you know, anti-vaxxers haven't emerged from a healthy ladder of lay participation in science. They have emerged from a world that doesn't have that. So um, I haven't answered your, your, your question of, of how, but I might actually point to 
some of the citizen science projects that started as Galaxy Zoo that I think Robert Boyle would have recognized as occasional meditation for the 21st century grown up. And some of those projects, um, you know, which start by by training individuals in 20 minutes to recognize the bar spiral galaxy from an elliptical galaxy to a spiral galaxy and give them the joy of knowing that this Hubble photograph, no other human eye has ever seen but yours. And your classification is a little piece of brand new science. I mean, it still gives on shivers down my spine and delighted when at Durham, I learned our, head, our then head of our theology department, Robert Song, went home in the evening and did Galaxy Zoo. Sorry, Robert, if you're listening, but everyone has to know. Great for theologians. Um, some of these projects are now beginning to think whether they ought not award some of their lay participants with PhDs. That's so, right. Let, let, me, let me bring in one of the questions from the large number that are flooding in to the Q&A, and this can be addressed by any panellist, I think. It's from Roger Bretherton, whom I know some of you do know. It seems to me that contemplation is often viewed as similar to other states such as mindfulness and reflection. Does the panel have any thoughts on the difference or similarity between contemplation, mindfulness and reflection? I'll just jump in here real, real quickly. Um, as I was reading Tom's uh, paper and then listening to him, um, I was thinking about the difference between contemplation and other orientations that we might take towards reality. And uh, I think there is for me a link between contemplation and imagination um, where the posture is one of openness and, and an invitation to discovery. I think many of us have um, perhaps had those moments of clarity and insight where the penny drops and we've been working on a problem for weeks and are washing the dishes one day or walking the dog. And all of a sudden just like the, 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 the idea just comes. And it's like, it, uh, it doesn't come unless we adopt a posture of listening and seeing and, and an openness to go deeper. Uh, and so that is the way that I was particularly understanding contemplation in this, in this setting, rather than a more um, like an identifiable neurobiological state. Could Thank I come you. in briefly? And Rowan, Rowan Williams, I could see also wanted to say something and then we'll have Sarah Coakley. So oh. Rowan first. Sorry, yes, just, just very briefly. I, I see part of the answer in thinking of a kind of spectrum, at one end of which is a process of what you might call internal adjustment and balancing that calms your rhythms and settles you down and enables you to get on a bit better with things. At the other end, perhaps something a little bit more like what um, Sarah is just talking about and what I touched on in my response, which is a real openness to uh, an agency that's about more than just rebalancing your insides but is giving you a share in something which is exposing you to an energy that is not your, your own. I think in, in the theological sense, contemplation belongs at that latter end and mindfulness a bit nearer the, the other end. But that's not to say that the wholly alien or that the, the disciplines and even techniques are totally different. But it's important to know that there are two ends to the spectrum, that there's more to talking about contemplation than just talking about um, getting a bit calmer in doing what you have to do. Um, I think one of the reasons we gulped when the excellent question was asked is that the terms meditation, mindfulness and contemplation have such a variety of meanings within different religious traditions and outside them. Um, so one can't give a univocal answer, but I think the crucial issue at stake here is whether what we have in mind involves some actual practice which has to be practiced in order for a transformation to occur in the person. Um, whether that be seen as relating to a divine entity who is activating it or not. And there's some very interesting material on the um, Q&A coming in from people who are very well versed in those traditions within uh, Christian contemplation, where there are perceived to be different stages of contemplation. And one doesn't arise up to the level of what Origen in the third century called physique, that is the ability to see the world from God's perspective, what Tom was, I think, talking about tonight, before going through a very painful and searching transformation based in the first stage, which he calls ethique, which means that 
something has to change in the self before one can leap to this closeness to God in seeing the book of nature from his perspective. So I think there are hugely major ascetical um, uh, messages in what uh, Tom is presenting to us and no quick fixes, which is why one of the things we might want to consider in our great curricular transformation that Tom has unleashed in our minds is the thought that actually learning to attend is as important as anything else, if not fundamentally important in our school studies. And I, I was really, I, I was really, really mm. by one of the things that Rowan uh, said in his talk, well, mm. I, I, uh, uh, which, he, um, it, which I think is very contemplative, but in, in, in the sense of the balance between t uh, contemplation is an attention, at least in Christian tradition it, the, of contemplation, it's an attention to a specific process, pattern, word, idea, person, um, but of course it excludes much else as well. And and this is right at the heart of what we have to do in, in, in science. Now, I realized that in some sense, I don't know how, how well I successfully communicated that the, the, the mathematization of entropy is, is, is a, a mathematically formal representation, I believe, of precisely this contemplative and decisive technique of, of attending to both what, that which we, um, uh, we, we uh, conceive of and that which we will, will push to the periphery. Um, and I think there's a sense in which maybe there's a third class of object, that which we're looking at intensely, those we know which we're ignoring, but that which we need to hold in our periphery. And, and I, I, I wonder whether, I'm just thinking aloud here, whether that, the peripheral view of this um, God's eye stance, taking into account that which we neither ignore nor focus on, but which is peripheral, not in a, a devalued sense, but in, but in this equally important framing sense is, is where some theology might be done. And not a million miles away from that, Tim Cragg starts as one of the questions by quoting from Proverbs 2, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God and asks quite straightforwardly, to what extent is there still a place for scientific truth leading directly to God? So if one of you would like to answer that one for us all, please. Well, I think I've already said, I, I, don't, I don't think it does. I think that's what natural theology was trying to do. I mean, maybe my colleagues can push me push back on this. And I think that's run into the, uh, run into the sand very quickly. But I think what doesn't run into the sand, well, this is, let's go back to what you said about periphery. You see, if you start doing what God does, if you start behaving and living as if, I mean, this is how many people find, find their, their road of faith, isn't it? They say, well, I don't know. I'm actually not, not, not I'm, no, I can't. I don't know what I believe, but let me just try it for a bit. Let me live as if this were true. Um, you, then you, you begin to understand in praxis, perhaps what C.S. Lewis was saying, it's not that by these things I can see God, but by the light of God, I understand everything else. And that makes more sense. I, I, I think there are, there are two possible uh, ways into this. One is... I, I agree absolutely with Tom that it's not a matter of scientific truth giving you the raw material from which you draw religious conclusions. That's certainly not what anyone's been talking about this evening. But there are, there's, first of all, there's the sheer sense of an unexpected congruence or harmonic in what you, what you intuit, what you imagine which is not wholly unlike, and this is back to some of the things that Tom was saying, not wholly, wholly unlike what I think T.S. Eliot described as the sense of the, the poet when the job's been done, feeling that something's come together with a kind of click. Um, that, that's an experience which triggers at least some sense in some people of an order in which you're sharing, not just an object that you're, um, you're scrutinizing. And then the second dimension, which is very much back to what 
Sarah was saying in her last contribution. Um, it's what has to happen to you in the practice of good science, the, the decentering of your private anxieties, concerns, desires, etc. That has that has a genuine ascetical quality. So in those two ways, I'd say, not only scientific truth but the pursuit of scientific truth do have a role for some people in the growth of mature commitment faith. For that reason, Tom, I wonder why you draw such a strong disjunction between natural theology, which you seem to think is completely defunct, um, and this other perspective. Um, it seems to me that they would, a renewed notion of natural theology would precisely um, concur with what you're saying about the necessity or the transformation of the viewer. Um, yeah. We can't well, just we can't just read God off scientific conclusions, um, but it's the kind of contemplative that might cause us to regenerate arguments for God. At least that's the line I've been taking recently myself, as yeah. some of you know. Yes, well, I mean, my, my, I, I'm partly you know rhetorical here i mean we you know we, we we've all been ta taught the sunday school <laughs> lessons of natural theology and you know but my point is this you know i know uh, many christian you know friends but when i was at college i remember the lovely posters of the galaxies and the and the uh, morning sunrise and a lovely version for, verse of the psalm we've all seen them lovely you can buy them buy them in all sorts of very worthy um uh, church bookshops and so forth fine nothing wrong with that but if you cannot equally illustrate that um uh, that uh, verse by with a volcano covering a forest and setting it alight with lava, or 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 or, or a lion devouring a live a, a, a live young gazelle, then there's something wrong with your theological appropriation of the world. You have to be able to do that. So it's partly rhetorical, but also you're quite right. Um, with Boyle, I think there's much more to be gleaned in the practice of science. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking now of a. Of, of, a, of a soft matter physicist I, I, I know Ron Last I've worked with for a long time, who's a, a wonderful soft matter physicist sort of in the chemical engineering department at the University of Michigan, who, who um, and a, a, a lifelong believer has written on, on theology of science too, um, who comments that is in fact science. Science is uncannily so difficult, just, just not too difficult to do. And then he left it at that uh, and, and I think there's I think there's something there that was suspicious certainly a Persian rumor of angels there was a wonderfully gnomic question from Bonnie Zal why are we doing this which puzzled me but then she explained that actually that's from her seven-year-old so that's going to be too difficult for <laughs> us to tackle now so I'll move on to one from Sarah Lynn Raish and encourage you to answer if you can quite succinctly because time is moving on rapidly. So from, from Mary Lynn Raish, I was struck with contemplation as a way to think about the unseen side and the hidden nature of things as being obvious in art. Cubism aimed to reveal all the unseen sides of an object at once via the imagination and the network of fungi that biologists found empirically verified as the probable source of trees being able not to talk to each other, but to make protective chemical signals. But in practice, we might need to show that this is how many solutions are revealed even to the non-scientists and on perhaps Buddhism is getting closer to doing this. And then the question that follows from that is the Western faith lagging in this and will people of no faith tolerate this approach in education i think the proper theologian should answer that one <laughs> so we have perhaps three people who might qualify for that but i want to make sure fraser gets a chance to say something at some point but either of the two sarahs or rowan do you want to have a go at some of that well, I am certainly not a proper theologian. I don't pretend to be one. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I would say that absolutely. Uh, the I think I think the point about Western versus non-Western Western religions uh, is a good one. And I think in particular around all the emerging research uh, surrounding organisms and symbiosis and just the embeddedness of humans within a larger ecological context, um, 
I think that the, the, our, our theology is oftentimes lagging behind the science on this one and um, other religions are certainly uh, articulating these insights probably better than we are. I'd want to put in a, a word for um, the Eastern Christian tradition itself here because mm. I, some of the language that I've used, I know that Sarah has used as well, um, does look to an approach to, to knowledge and finding your way in the world in terms of sharing something, sharing the intelligible life that God communicates, um, so that you, you are not seen as a detached observer with a lot of dead stuff to work on. And I, I think it's a bit of a bit of a shortcut to say Christianity as such, or indeed the Judeo-Christian tradition as such, don't think about that. We've seen what there is in Hebrew scripture that flows into this. We can pick up all sorts of um, cues and traditions within the Christian tradition, largely Eastern, but of course also the Western tradition represented by something like Grosteste or uh, indeed some aspects of 17th century Christian reflection. So yes, that there's, there's a real question there, but a lot to be quarried. I don't think it's easy at all to smuggle um, uh, a theological package into a secular school system without explosive uh, responses. There may be some rather um, covert ways in which you could creep up on it by pointing out the importance of cognitive therapy um, for certain kinds of uh, depression that we're all suffering from at the moment as a result of the pandemic, um, or of attending neurophysiologically to the significance of certain kinds of attention for any educational advance. But I think it would be naive to assume that we could simply um, uh, enforce <laughs> a, a neo-theological um, package here. No, it's, it's not going to happen overnight, but I, I take from what you've said also that there's an issue about how we rethink the whole business of our definitions of knowledge. Mm. And one of the things I find most helpful in somebody like Cardinal Newman is the way in which in his grammar of assent, greatest mm. philosophical work of the 19th century in the English language, arguably, he says, look at, look at the ways we actually know things and find things out. Um, it's not that there's an absolutely privileged, perfectly clear area, and then a lot of impressionistic fluff. There's an enormous amount of cooperation, guesswork, intuition, imagination, um, seeking for congruence, finding it unexpectedly. And that's just our human habit. And that's also why you thought theology had to be part of the curriculum of the university. <laughs> what? Fraser. Yes. I mean, I'm intrigued by the idea of science as being more like contemplation, and I kind of wonder what that would look like. It's almost 30 years since I stopped working for the Medical Research Council, and I haven't done much, much science since then. But, the, and, um, I, I mean, what, what what would science be like if it was the kind of activity that it, it that you could do better if you'd done some contemplative practice in order to be a better scientist? And and what kind of science would help you to contemplate better? I mean, is there a possibility of integrating them to that extent? And and I wonder whether there are things to be learned from romantic science, which in some ways has tried to do that. And I'm thinking, for example, of Goethe's way of looking at, at plants, sort of um, studying, studying plant form and the way leaves change as you go up the stem of a plant so you can really hold it in your mind. I mean, Goethe saw that as a scientific activity, but it was clearly also a contemplative activity. And is that really science? Well, you made a distinction, Tom, between, between scientific discovery and, and the other things and the proof demonstration. And, and I think that kind of romantic science, meditative science can be a way of doing scientific discovery. And if we, if we did that as a regular part of scientific activity, it would revolutionize science and would bring it much closer to contemplation. Yeah, well, let me just say, I, I think actually it, science would not look very different um, uh, from, from how it, it looks now, uh, because, because all, uh, we, we're just not good at talking about it. Um, you know, it, it. The scientific method, as I wrote in one of the books, is at best a method for the second half of the scientific process. It's for how you test and prove, in the old sense of the word, um, your hypotheses when you have them. How, it, that, 
you know, achieving a hypothesis can only happen through what I'm calling contemplation. Now that's a half definition of contemplation. Um, but I think also it, 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 in terms of the, the lay point, one of the most moving experiences that I've ever had is with a next door neighbor when we lived in, a, a, in Sheffield, I think it was, who were, we were looking at the moon and the crescent moon or the half moon in the sky. And we were talking about it. And I think this is you know, someone in their middle, middle age. They realized for the first time why the moon looked that shape. And suddenly from being this half penny picture in the sky, they gasped and it's a gasp of realizing there's this ball out there whirling around the earth, being illuminated by the sun way over there. And there's something profoundly human and theological and poetic in that moment. You know, it, it is both the, the actually that very that very notion was employed as I'm sure Rowan knows in the most beautiful passage of Gregory of Nyssa I've I've ever read in, in his deathbed conversation with 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 Macrina in the Soul and the Resurrection. That very ability is 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 seen as proof of of the reality of psyche. So um, uh, it would look something like that. I think. Now, I need to apologize for the many people who've asked questions that we're not going to be able to address in conversation, but we have had a very rich, very rich discussion between our panelists. And Tom, I think you ended there on a rather wonderful, wonderful point. I'm going to ask Jonathan Boyle now if he'd like to join us. And the point is that Michael, John, could I say one... something very briefly, and then I'm going to go to Jonathan. Michael, can I just say one thing about the questions? There are so many rich ones. I have a blog. I've, I will capture the questions in text, um, put them on the blog, answer them. My colleagues here, if they wish to comment on them, will do so. So no one's question will go unanswered. They are so rich and we've only just scraped the, 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 the surface of them. So I'll, I'll promise to do that. That is a wonderful idea. Thank you ever so much, Tom. Now, I'm delighted that Jonathan Boyle has joined us. Jonathan is Earl of Cork. He's Earl of Orrery. He is Baron Boyle of Marston. And there is a clue there because he is a direct descendant of uh, Robert Boyle himself. Jonathan. Michael, thank you. Um, it's very hard indeed to know where to start after, after all of that, but I will um, try to finish before I start. <clears throat> Um, this evening, we should all have been enjoying uh, canapes <clears throat> in one of London's great livery halls. And um, instead, we've been listening to one of the most fascinating Boyle lectures that I, I can remember. Um, we somehow um, have moved on to, in a whole, how should we put it? Um, I wonder if we can find a way to, to incorporate all of this uh, again, we've we've moved into a new era. COVID has forced us into um, thinking through the whole uh, structure of, of these lectures and what has given us, uh, on top of the um, the cosy atmosphere of St Mary Le Beau and the delivery halls, is the ability to reach out to what I see was 330 participants uh, at one point, and and questioners. Um, going on for technically for hours. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, we might have been treated to some of Tom's splendid demonstrations in the pulpit in St. Mary, but I'm not entirely sure about the jangly bit. It might have been easier to see the, um, the, the, the plastic deformation in a vertical fashion rather than horizontally. Quite. <laughs> <laughs> I also wonder, um, whether the uh, BDI of Robert Boyle on the wall of the Royal Society um, had clearly had influenced Tom's thinking uh, over many hours of boring uh, council, council conversations, uh, because he's certainly been absorbing very much of his thinking. Uh, and we were treated to an awful lot of uh, extremely valuable quotation from the works of Boyle, many of which I've got sitting on my shelf, but very few of which I've actually read. So um, I feel that we've been treated to a lecture in that, in that as well. But the main reason for my appearing at the end of, uh, of, the, of the affair is to thank uh, quite a large number of people. Firstly, all of you participants on the panel, um, which who have been producing questions of enormously high quality and of fascinating content. Um, but more importantly, perhaps from the point of view of the 
worthwhile lecture, the, those behind the scenes. Um, ISSR, Michael Rice and Fraser Watts, who you've both met or met, um, obviously are the main um, organizers of, of the series these days. And Fraser in particular has put an enormous amount of work into creating a seamless um, web presentation with people from all over the country meeting up on the same screen um, and creating the, the atmosphere we, we've achieved. Um, we should also thank the, um, the great, great companies, the grocers and the mercers who have been extremely supportive and have uh, helped us with financial contribution as well to keep the, keep the lecture series on the, on the road. Uh, the sadness is that we're not enjoying their canopies this evening, which is a source of great amusement to us all because each year they compete to produce um, a better set of canopies than the last, and we, all, we always enjoy those. Um, the, also, the, the, the important areas which have gone rather unsung have been behind the scenes at York uh, University, where Steve Parker, um, thank you, Steve, very much for your help today in getting my links sorted out, um, has been uh, an, an extremely adept technical consultant to the whole, whole organization. And um, at ISSR, where Anthony Nairn has done a, a great deal of, of uh, behind the scenes work to ensure that the links got out to everybody, the invitations were sent and so on and so forth. And of course, finally, to the denizens of St. Mary Le Beau who have supported us beyond measure uh, since this series started. I've just had a, uh, a WhatsApp from um, uh, from Michael Byrne, who has also been amongst the uh, amongst the the, um, uh, the audience, uh, saying how much he'd enjoyed it. So I think we've all achieved, and in the case of uh, of the technicians, overachieved in putting this all on tonight. So thank you all very very much indeed uh, for a most interesting and also unique Boyle lecture. Thank you. Jonathan very much.